Holy crap. It's like a, like a 1500 street fight. Oh, let's go get closer. There was something that just drew me into this. Like I had magnets in my pockets and everybody was wearing metal. This is insane. Well, it'll get more insane the more you sit here and watch it. But, uh, <laughs> oh, oh. This event is Carolina Carnage. Started out as like six teams. And now this year we are right around the 500 mark. 44 active teams fighting today. That guy's like a hundred of the 200 people probably. <laughs> He's like, I think he might be like six men fit into one yeah. piece. And as big as that guy is, let's not get distracted. Cause Larry just gave us our first funny hat of the day. Throw it on the board. Thank you. Going into my day of Boo Hurt, I had a couple of goals. Number one, first and foremost, I wanted to see some matches. I've already done that. Second, I want to get as much information as I possibly can here. I'm super curious about the history, the weapons, the armor. I want to know what the rules are to this chaos. And then thirdly, I want to kick somebody in there. I, I cannot explain why I just do. I want to see what it feels like. I want to see if it's possible. And I want to assert my dominance. Yeah, this guy. This guy wants to assert his dominance. I don't know. I don't get it uh, either. A lot of the time they think it's something like a uh, lap. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt here. Just... Gonna put this right here. Okay. It's more like action role playing, it's more jokey and having some fun. Yeah. Until I realize, no, everyone's going 100%. So it's like MMA yeah. with armor. So the hits are real. Yeah. Obviously, weapons aren't sharp. Right. But everything is 100% full on. As you can see, every strike is as hard as possible. Uh, a lot of judo uh, throws are in, in there, obviously, to learn how to uh, do takedowns. So it's a lot of different skills yeah. from a lot of different sports. How much do they feel of it? Oh, you can feel it. So obviously, broken bones can happen. It's, you probably, hopefully we won't have any here at this event. A lot of the time, it's going to be a lot of bruises. So afterwards, you'll see some good bruises. <laughs> and now that we kind of have an idea of what in the heck is happening, I wanted to watch a match. I wanted to pay close attention to one specifically. Okay, specifically Order of the Pegasus, in which there's a fighter that's gained the nickname Little Purple. So what are you thinking about when you're in there? To try to do my best and yeah. I'm not the best grappler, but you know, working on it and working with the team, sure. talking to each other so we know what we're doing. And to go along with Little Purple, there's also a Big Purple. A lot of the times you have to be aware of everything going on in the field to be able to assess your teammate situation and see where you're needed the most while also keeping their center position at bay. There's a lot of strategy that goes into what I'm doing. I'm not even thinking about taking down my opponent or even hitting them. And for someone who's not thinking about taking someone else down, Big Purple's awfully good at it. Do you ever like yell for somebody? Does that work? Can you, can the very first round I was sort of middle of the rail. Celeste, my Big Purple, was on yeah. the by the gate, I called for her and she heard me and came out. She's like protecting her, look. That's crazy. It's almost like they don't know they're being hit by swords. Everybody's giggling and laughing and having a good time. But at the same time, it is horrifying. I think by the time you go down, it's like, oh sweet, I didn't get hurt. Awesome. That's my guess. But I'm sure the reason is more likely because they're wearing 60 plus pounds of steel armor, if I had to guess. So you got your rear braces, your van braces, your pauldrons, okay. and then underneath here is called the brigadine. Whoa. <laughs> you got your legs, yeah. your greaves, yeah. and then your sabatons. This is the lighter one. Do you know how much this one weighs? I think like 65 pounds. I'm sure you don't, but do you weigh your armor like I weigh my dog? Like, I, to weigh my dog, I'll step on the scale, and then I'll pick up my 100%. dog and I'll step on the scale? 100%. Is that how it goes? Yeah. You just, is it in your bathroom? Uh, I bring it out in the living room. It's a little bit easier rather than lifting a suitcase in the bathroom. The bathroom's kind of small. The baggage, or when you fly, it's oh. 50 pounds. Oh, yeah. So that's how I kind of know. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, it's expensive when uh, you do overweight bags. Because some guys just started oh. wearing their armor on the plane. I'd imagine you'd have a really hard time getting through TSA. Which brings us to a brief oversimplified assumption and explanation of the sport by me, Seth. So it seems like 
the big guys are kind of being used to like disseminate any wrestling. So if their guy is getting wrestled, a big guy will step in the middle, which makes it harder for the littler guy to get taken down. And the little guys just kind of run around and, and bother people and they hit them with the sticks. And because there's weapons, they don't have to be as powerful to make it all happen. But I don't know, that could just be what it seems like. And you know the phrase, things are often exactly as they seem. Or maybe that's not the case. We're gonna do lots more research anyway. Sorry, hold on, reverse it. Thank you. Okay, so what kind of weapons are we working with here? You've got short hatchets, optimized and ideal for in close clinch work and grappling. Okay. You've got mid length axes, which are kind of the mixture between striking and wrestling. Okay. The longer axes you'll see, anything over four foot, a little bit more optimized for striking. Okay. And then falchions, they're swords that are good kind of all purpose, you know, and if it was a video game, they're the average across the board stat weapon exactly. because no one else can grab it, but you can't either. Your blade is like untouchable. The other thing that you'll see, which you might not think about as much is the difference in certain types of shields. Like you see this fighter over here with the big ovule punch shield. That shield right there, terrible for wrestling. Very defensive. Okay. But a lot of people, they use these very tiny bucklers, the small round shields. Yes. Because it's optimized for striking and grappling. Okay. But it's like, people say, why use a shield at all? Because when someone like has a heavy halberd, it's nice to have just something, something there. Because yeah. like my shield and most modern ones are like fiberglass or titanium. Okay. So it's Ooh. pretty solid. Bow hurt rules, when you touch the ground with three points of contact, you're yeah. down. Okay. Only time there's like an exception to that rule is if you perform an offensive maneuver. So like you get somebody, you do that, you're good. You know what I mean? But if you just do that in open field, you're dead. Sorry, hold on, pause. Did he say dead? I guess it makes sense being that this is fighting with swords and it's originated probably like hundreds of years ago. This is rooted in, I'd imagine, historically accurate armor, weapons. At what point did this change from a means of war to this sport? So originally it was a form of practicing for war. Right. So throughout the medieval times, these sorts of tournays were done. And sometimes they were done on horseback, they would be done on foot. Yeah. Um, we do bigger categories as well. So tomorrow there's a 12 versus 12, and we do categories as big as 30 versus 30. And those are different tactics again, different stuff going on. One of the things that people kind of forget is that a lot of the time the guys who had armor are even noblemen who don't really want to be dying a lot of the time. So they would hold tourneys like this to decide things. They're like, that's my bit of land. Or the other guys would be like, no, that's not. That's my land. You, and then they would get that, their arms then and they would hold tournaments like this. This wasn't like something that was like, oh, remember when they did this? That was pretty sick, let's no, do it. it. This was done in the medieval times. The other reason it was done was if you were a hedge knight, you a guy that didn't have a, really a lord, didn't own his own land, but had armor, yeah. then um, how you did in tournaments directly kind of influenced what you could charge for your services. Ah. So if you did well at tournaments, that's what a lot, a lot of the reasons tournaments are held. You could then turn around and be like, look, I smashed this tournament, I'm a fucking awesome fighter. Yeah, right. I'm worth X. Yeah, right. And then lords who were like looking for arms then, and then they might find someone like that and go, okay, cool, I'll give you a bit of land. You can work for me. That's interesting. For us, obviously, this sport died off completely and vanished until reenactors in Russia basically wanted to go harder. So they were doing like reenactment events. And they were like, essentially, do you know what would be fun? If we did these reenactment battles, but for real. Yeah. And being Russia with no health and safety, no insurance problems, boom, yeah. they just started doing it. And from there, it just kind of escalated and grew. Yeah. And they got more popular. And then it kind of went out of Russia to Belarus, Poland, Ukraine, and they all got involved. And then kind of the rest of the world saw it and went, we want to be doing that. The reason the rules are, if you get thrown to the floor, you're done, yeah. is because on a battlefield, if you got thrown to the floor, you were 99% of the time, you were a dead man. Right. Because yeah. You won't get it up. So I step on you and I just do this to you. It's so heavy, yeah, right. Well, it's not the, so much the weight, it's the fact that if I want to stop you, I can stand on you and stick a knife into you faster than you can get up. Which is terrifying, but uh, it's not the point. This guy is Daniel and he, along with the other fellow Johnny, are actually members of a team called Dominus, possibly one of the best teams in the world. You're with uh, Team Dominus, is that right? I am for this tournament. Dominus is a sick name. This is Daniel Krug, this is the captain of Dominus. Hey, nice, nice to meet you. you, nice to meet yeah. you. Yeah. So. I mean, it takes us about 20 minutes to get armor on. Can't get it on faster in an emergency. You know, like if we were suddenly get a call and be like, crap, 
Okay, well, I, was, I was just thinking what an emergency would be, like like a home invasion. Well, not perhaps, yeah. but you know, it's not really recommended. Yeah. Yeah. Which really makes you wonder. Did this guy think he'd get away from me? Dominus doesn't fight in the traditional methodology of any of the other teams across the world. It's more of a react to contact drill. Okay. So uh, it's more of a if then, if then, if then. Okay. So essentially we create a, a thought process algorithm for our team. So we have positions. We have the one, two, and three positions. Okay. The one's on the rail, the two is next to the rail, and the three fights in the middle. So the left, one and two, right, one and two, middle three. Yeah. Essentially, most of our plays are based off of an initiation tactic, which would be a lot like a football play yep. or even a hockey play. Okay. Uh, and then, moving forward, it's a response tactic. Hey, that first round was beautiful. What? Sensei Seth! You don't think it's because I said he had a funny hat, do you? Beautiful teamwork in that first round. Absolutely amazing. Perfect, yeah. Right whale. Way to fucking blow it and way to actually work those work that teamwork. That was phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. It worked really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Wonder if they would let me in some of this. Like if they would let me try the armor out. And it's one o'clock and you're the same, you're a little bit bigger than me, but not sure. much. So I mean, yeah. I could put you in my armor. It'll be put on pretty fast. So obviously what I wear is very high grade armor. So it's not as heavy as what some of the guys wear. Okay. Do you no, this is really light. Yeah, it's titanium. Huh. Hurts like hell if you get hit wearing it. But, okay. you know, when you're a high level fighter, that doesn't matter. Don't yes. get hit. Well, that and just, I'm tougher. Be tough. You know? Yeah, okay. Don't get hit, be tough. Okay. You know, the gamberson, my gamberson, obviously, is going to smell because, because I've worn it today. Is it wet? It's a little bit damp, so I can give you my rash guard that's over there, and that way this won't get damp or... Okay. All right, so what are we doing? So the, you always start from the bottom. As you can see, I put a little bit of padding on the inside. I see that, yeah. It's to just take a bit of shock out when I'm kicking people. Because obviously... For you? For me. Because obviously it's steel against my uh, shin. So if I kick someone, I'm essentially kicking a steel okay. post. With the karate, yeah. you, you do, yes. Yeah. You could totally knock someone out with head kicks. Sick. So you're getting a true knight experience here. The what is it? A true knight experience, because you, you got an esquire. <laughs> <laughs> you don't normally get this. You usually have to put it on yourself. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I could do it, but I'd need an instruction manual. And I'll be honest, I don't even read those. I'd probably end up like a poorly put together set of Ikea furniture. <laughs> but I tell you what, I would not want to walk around in a piece of Ikea furniture while somebody hit me with a sword. <laughs> so it's probably best to pay attention to the small details when you're putting this stuff on. Because I am going to be getting hit with something today. Wait, is this, is this it? Yeah, the farmer. Wow. I expected like a big piece over the chest. No. no. This is what's called a brigantine. It's plates inside a jacket, essentially. Yeah. You know, it stops you getting broken underneath, but as you can feel. Oh, yeah, it's not nothing, for you, sure. What's really interesting to me is that probably the more times that you wear this armor, the more it kind of fits your mold. And I wonder if the armor starts to kind of become them. Yes. Do, do you know how to swing a sword or? Yeah, or, sort of. Sort of. This is a really vulnerable spot. Yeah. If this legs far forward and I can see flesh. Yeah. I would be looking for outside shots on arms. Right. Like round here, around the elbow. If I can see a gap, bringing it, trying to bring it up underneath. Because of the way Briggs are, that's always a vulnerable spot. Right. This actually hitting the head doesn't actually do that much, as much as you would think. Yeah. Because this protects you. Right. It doesn't stop the concussion, but it stops the damage to the face. Sorry, what? We've moved on to work on a couple of combinations, but I wanted to feel what it was like to move in this armor again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Oh, that's tiring. Really? Yeah. So in our sport, mostly when we're fighting, um, we focus on throwing big hits because gentle ones, obviously with the nature of armour, yeah. doesn't do a lot. So which we would uppercut, but it would be a, a really big one. Yeah. So it, it, what it is, is you know, the stronger fit enough, it's not a problem. What it is, is you're wearing weight. And so every movement, micro movement you make, every micro movement you weigh, you're now taking energy. Yeah, right. Because of the weight. <laughs> No, that's not a good idea. I would not do that again. It was a little harder than I expected to throw the kick. Oh, air. You guys are probably used to that. Yeah, yeah. You get a lot of work on CO2 backwash. Yeah, even just being in it, it's like, it's pretty draining. Unfortunately though, that is something I would have to get used to. As I was suiting back up again, for a match. Yes, you heard that right. I hopped in there with Dominus. It was the craziest experience. That's actually me that's about to get saved right here. Let me tell you, it was a wild experience. I've never felt anything like that. And no, don't panda me. Pan go. I'm supposed to be in the thing. Okay, it's not me. I'm not in there. But boy, am I glad I wasn't. I guess it would be fine if I was in there and Dominus was on my team because those guys work together so well. They went on to win every single one of their matches and they left with a first place trophy. A lot of the teams here have really opened my eyes to how much more tactical this sport actually is rather than what I thought before of just a big guy and a little guy working together to do shenanigans. Not a lot of shenanigans anymore. Y'all are insane. I don't even know what to say. And y'all just kill it every time. Yeah, teamwork is is everything, man. That's what being on the rail keeps you safe too. Like, there's a lot of people like running around, and like rail sense. discipline keeps you from catching crosswind. Yeah, it's, it's like a high variable problem that you're solving, where you have to be thinking of like. What are the four or five most likely things my opponents are about to do? Right, the four or five most likely things that I was going to do were all starve. I was hungry in a medieval horse that couldn't greet people. He's got no hay. Good sir, I'll give you a combat for three heated dogs. We're going to sit down and we're going to actually just watch. We've been so deep in the action that I haven't really gotten to fully appreciate it as a spectator sport. I've just been learning everything. Sir, where can I find a heated canine? Even the hot dogs come in armor. Don't edit this. So it makes you wonder if this is a sport that's been around for hundreds of years, most likely along with the sport, they had these markets too. Like they were probably culturally not too different from it is now. Like there's a bunch of people who all had the same hobby who were all super interested in doing something, who weren't like trying to fight in a war, but were like, this is a sport, I want to prove myself and test myself on something I enjoy. And then surrounded by them were like a bunch of things that were closely associated with it. Um, that actually might be new though, all this stuff. That might not have been there before, if I had to guess. By the time I finally sat down and got to watch the matches, I noticed that there was like these sparks. Yo, they're gonna catch this place on fire. Which is cool, but made me start to wonder how much of this armor is actually holding itself together every match. Over the course of the fight, I broke two pauldrons and someone's back plate. I saw sparks flying and then I saw the... Uh, I saw that too. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm pretty sure we have it. Yeah, oh, sick! I think so. And then uh, I saw that his shoulder just like slumped down, but I got my axe up under his backplate and I saw the backplate separate from his armor. 
<laughs> uh, so I guess they just like go back and try and fix it as best they can? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, if you haven't seen them yet, there's like a whole blacksmith setup. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll see you guys. I quickly skedaddled my way over to got a blacksmith stand to see what is essentially a pit crew of medieval work. So what are they working on right now? So right now, in my last fight, I threw someone and our armor got caught together yeah. and it uh, cut two of my straps on the leg. Rivet's all good, but like a little le leather right there just sheared it right off. So that's just the replacement. How often does that kind of stuff happen? Believe it or not, that one's pretty common, especially on the legs with the, the big knee thin. What's the worst? Like piece of damage you've seen. you either had or seen. The worst that like I've experienced, bent over getting hit out of armor in the butt. I had a big old bruise that was like from hip to leg. Yeah. It was good after about a week. Oh well, yeah, that's, it's fine. That's good. And while not everybody has been that lucky to simply receive a butt shot. Yeah, I mean, since I've been fighting, I broke my hand, broke my foot, separated disc in my spine, broken two ribs. My hip is currently slightly out of place. Yeah, so it's it's tough. It's crazy how wild of a sport this is because surprisingly damage is not necessarily the goal the overarching idea of of armored combat and boohert worldwide um, our kind of slogan is called boohert is love and what we mean by that as a sport is that dude, the sport is so dangerous basically there's the the propensity for injury either you know injuring somebody or your teammates getting injured um, a lot of our training, especially my team, the Warlords and Dominus, uh, really goes to protecting our friends and kind of sort of protecting your enemy, right? There's, there's situations where like you could really, really injure somebody and you choose to just take them down instead of actually injuring them. And part of that is just mutual respect uh, for the consent that goes into fighting, right? Like they're consenting to you hitting them with weapons and you're consenting for them to hit you with weapons. And that whole component kind of just revolves around love for your teammates and your, your enemies. Oh, oh, you thought, you thought I wasn't done? You thought you were safe just because you're a little baby?